Okay, here we are. We we uh, we ended with the sentence accepted blindly by the body and soul. And so in this very, very important part of Savitri, we have seen that this hour falls on her where <clears throat> she realizes that life must be in vain. Or there's something in her, in her unborn element, awake, that her will can cancel her body's destiny. And Mother says this about all of us, that yes, fate is fixed, but a greater will can cancel that. And she says that when we give ourselves to her, she takes up that work to cancel our fate and our body's destiny. So we had those two, we had the, the word raise the fixed interminable line. And, and that line is, is something that all of us have. We've had many, many changing names. We've had numberless lives. We have, have had oblivious personalities also because uh, very often we come, when we come into a new birth, there's a great shock a tremendous shock to the body, and we forget everything of the past. And it could take many, many years until we realize something that has moved us to this birth and what our purpose is in this present life. So we'll begin with an episode in an unremembered tale. It's beginning lost, its motive and plot concealed. A once living story has prepared and made our present fate, child of past energies. Well, Sri Arbindo is telling us about karma right here, very clearly. We, uh, We're living in an episode in an unremembered tale. It's so beautiful. But we've lost the beginning. We've lost, well, the, the motive and the plot are concealed. That's true. But, but no longer for us. No longer for us who have, who have come to Sri Aurobindo and Mother. Because Mother has said, oh, I just had something here from Anmol today. Very beautiful. Where Mother says, Sri Aurobindo has come to tell us it is not necessary to leave the earth to find the truth. It is not necessary to leave life to find one's soul. It is not necessary to give up the world or to have limited beliefs in order to enter into relation with the divine. The divine is everywhere, in everything. And if he is hidden, it is because we do not take the trouble to discover him. This is in collective works of the mother. So that once living story. <clears throat> um, oops, I'm stuck. Okay, here we go. Uh, So we're here now. We're here with Savitri, beginning to understand what she has to do in the world. And as I explained last time, and I had a couple of questions from our attendees, that the story of Savitri takes place in one day. Only one day. The... Last line of the first canto of book one is, this was the day when Satyavan must die. And Satyavan dies at noon. And then at the very end of the day, Savitri brings him back to meet his parents. His father now has his sight back. He's a king again. And... Uh, father chides him a little bit, where have you been? 
And he says, lay all on her on savagery, because I was someplace, and we'll get into that many, uh, maybe years later, but so here we just carry on. So that's, that's one full day, morning, noon, and night. So what does she have to do? <laughs> Who will begin to read for us about the fixity of the cosmic sequences? Anyone? Uh, I, I can start. Okay. An episode in an unremembered tale. Its beginning lost. Its motive and plot concealed. A once living story has prepared and made. Our present fate, child of past energies. So we, we have covered that. Um, the fixity of the cosmic sequences fastened with hidden inevitable links. She must disrupt, dislodge by her soul's force. Her past, a block on the immortal's road. Make her raised ground and shape anew. Of fate. So we have seen in 17 lines, Sri Aurobindo repeats the word raise. First, he says she has to raise the fixed interminable line. Well, the self has to do this, the self in all of us. And here, uh, what does she have to do? She have to, has to disrupt and dislodge by her soul's force the fixity of these cosmic sequences that are fastened with hidden inevitable links. <clears throat> now, these cosmic sequences are, we can say they are part of the Leela of the divine. We can also say they are fixed forces that that are in our earthly atmosphere, evolutionary atmosphere, and, and they are fastened with links that are hidden and inevitable. They have to be there because that's the only way that man can progress. But what she has to do is she has to dislodge her past which is a block on the immortal's road. She has to make a raised ground, in other words, completely demolish everything and therefore shape anew her fate. And this is really something only Savitri can do because she's the Divine Mother, the Son. Uh, we can do it. If we have hundreds and hundreds of lives, thousands of lives perhaps, or it can be done by mother in us, even in one lifetime. Uh, so we should carry on now. Who someone could read for us? A colloquy of the original gods. Meeting upon the borders of the unknown, our souls debate with embodied nothingness, must be wrestled out on a dangerous dim background. Her being must confront its formless cause against the universe where its single self on the bare peak where self is alone with not, and life has no sense and love, no place to stand. She must plead her case upon extinction's verge in the world's death cave, uphold life's helpless claim, and vindicate her right to be and love. So there we are. Beautiful. This is what she has to do. Thank you. She has to have a formal 
conversation or discussion, we could call a colloquy. This would be with the original gods. And she meets them upon the borders of the unknown. Her souls debate with bodied nothingness, must be wrestled out on a dangerous dim background. Because she's alone here. She's totally alone. There's no one to help her. We'll find that later on. Her being must confront its formless cause. Now, her being is formless because she is part of the unborn, the self-born force. Um, in Savitri, we have two lines with self-born. Uh, and one of those lines has to do with mother and the other has to do with Sri Aurobindo. So she has to weigh that her single self against the universe. And so now he speaks of this bare peak where self, capital S, is alone with naught, with nothingness. And life has no sense and even love has no place to stand there. She has to plead her case upon extinction's verge in the world's death cave. Uphold life's helpless claim and vindicate her right to be and love. What a task she has been given here. Uh, Edith, could you read a little bit for us? Yes. Good. Yes. Altered must be nature's harsh economy. Acquittance she must win from her past's bond. An old account of suffering exhaust. Strike out from time the soul's long compound depth and the heavy servitudes of the karmic gods, the slow revenge of unforgiving law, and the deep need of universal pain and hard sacrifice and tragic consequence. Well, there we are. So this, there's a lot to speak of here. Um, what is her past bond? Um, well, she has incarnated many, many times on earth. <clears throat> There's a bond of the past for all of us. And there are two things that are very interesting. One is a statement from Mother where she says, at every moment, we must shake off the past like fading dust, that it may not soil the virgin path which at every moment also is opening before us. That's in her prayers and meditations. But we must also remember that there are things from our past that have helped us to get where we are. So we should not, as the common saying goes, throw out the baby with the bathwater. We should accept the things of the past that brought us to where we are now. But we have to win acquittance from our past bond, which is what she has to do now. She has to exhaust this old account of suffering and strike out from time the soul's long compound debt. So this is all the things of the past that have to be, that Savitri now has to do and we will have to do or mother will do for us. And the heavy servitudes of the karmic gods, well, what a statement. And 
perhaps you could say something about that in a moment, Vladimir, because this is so important. The slow revenge of unforgiving law. Sri Aurobindo capitalizes the L of law. Wow. And the deep need of universal pain and hard sacrifice and tragic consequence. Isn't that our earth? It certainly is. Vladimir? Well, yeah. There's uh, that many thoughts are coming here, and especially with the, in relation to this heavy servitudes mm -hmm. of the karmic gods. Who are these gods, karmic gods? Actually, in the Taitiriya, they are mentioned, yes? They saw the gods who, by karma, became gods, yeah? by the action. And there are karmic gods, the gods who take care of what is done and what is to be done, how it is linked between what is done and to be done. So that has to go in one way, the whole manifestation. It's one uh, intelligent design, you know. It's not just out of the blue. So they provide that ground where all things are being connected or meaningfully connected. And uh, that's how they become karmic gods. So somewhere long ago we had this uh, presentation by George S. Van Verecken, mm -hmm. who spoke on the intelligent design and that scientists discovered if there would be a little alternation somewhere in the past of something like beetle will just do something else, then the whole tapestry of development and the whole evolution would take totally different shape. So yes. so somebody knows how things should be done in time and in, in, in circumstances, in consequences. So the, the cause and effect is constantly looked into. And, um, and these are the karmic gods, the heavy certitude, yes. Yes. servitude, sorry. They are, they are to serve that particular tapestry and connect all things into one developmental paradigm. Well, we will see a lot more of this in um, the um, Canto Four of this of, of savagery, the secret knowledge, because he speaks of these beings who uh, they are careless of the grief that stings the world heart. They are careless of the pain that rends its body and life. Above joy and sorrow is that grandeur's walk. They have no portion in the good that dies. Because if they had any portion in this, their strength might be marred and could not save. Very interesting. And I will go into that when we get to that point, because there's a lot there. And uh, I would like to uh, go a little bit more into this revenge of unforgiving law, because the law is very fixed in many ways in this play of the divine evolutionary uh, nexus. Uh, the law is sees that there is this deep need of universal pain and this hard sacrifice and this tragic consequence. Because um, how else can we grow? We, we, we always, have, always have had sacrifice. We've always had tragic consequences. There has been an endless need of universal pain. And so how is that going to break? We will see that next. Perhaps... Uh, Vladimir, you could read a little. Mm -hmm. Out of a timeless barrier she must break, penetrate with her thinking depths the void's monstrous harsh. Look into the lonely eyes of immortal death, and with her nude spirit 
measure the infinite's night. Yes. Well, uh, now he tells us what has to be done. This barrier that's timeless, she has to break through it. And she has to penetrate with her thinking depths the void's monstrous hush. This absolute silence, vast silence of the void. It's like a monstrous hush. But the key here is that she has to look finally into the eyes of immortal death. And with her nude spirit, measure the infinite's night. So those four lines give us what she has to do. She has to break through the timeless barrier, penetrate with her thinking depths this void, look into the lonely eyes of immortal death, and with her nude spirit, measure the infinite's night. We know that Mother says that death is also a part of her. And the cantos with the debate of death are so extraordinary. I hope we can get to them in time. So now we have Ashwini to read, perhaps, from this great and dolorous moment that's now close. The great and dolorous moment now was close. A mailed battalion marching to its doom. The last long days went by with heavy tramp, long but too soon to pass, too near the end. So the moment has come upon her now. And that moment is like a mailed battalion. Mailed is armored with heavy armor that's marching to its doom, marching to its doom. And so even the days go by with heavy tramp of this marching mailed battalion. And the days are long but they're too soon to pass, too near the end. Why are they too soon to pass and too near the end? We have to remember that, Sat, that Narad said that Satchavan is going to pass within one year, he'll die. And so these days when she has to confront death, look into his immortal, and lonely eyes, she has to uh, feel the days going by with heavy tramp, like a male battalion that's marching to its doom. And it's, it's, it's long, but it's also too soon to pass, too near the end. Why? Well, oh, I don't see anyone else, so I'll read a little. Alone, amid the many faces loved, aware among unknowing happy hearts, her armored spirit kept watch upon the hours, listening for a foreseen tremendous step in the closed beauty of the inhuman wilds. Also oh, now he tells us that she is obviously with such one. She's in the inhuman wilds. And it's a closed beauty because it's sheltered by these huge mountainous mountains with, with peaks that are assailing the heavens, as he says in another passage, much later on in, in the Book of Love. And she's, she's alone among the many faces loved, because she cannot tell anything about what she's going through. And she's aware, and, and all, she's aware among all these unknown happy hearts. 
because they're so delighted to have her. I mean, she's she's the daughter of the sun, yet, but she's also human, and she stokes the fire, and she brings water, and and Satyavan brings the the wood for cooking, and and so she's she's aware amongst these unknown happy hearts, but she can't tell them anything. But her spirit is armored. It's armored. We have to remember that that nothing can truly touch the Divine Mother. And it keeps watch upon the hours, listening for a foreseen tremendous step in the closed beauty of the inhuman wilds. Uh, what is that foreseen tremendous step? Can someone tell me what it is? The prediction. No, it's death. Mm. She's listening. She's listening for death's coming to take Satyavan. Yes, I thought that was the prediction, yes. Yes. Listening for a foreseen tremendous step. Tremendous step, obviously. Death is huge. Up until now, it's been inevitable until the supramental. In the closed beauty of the inhuman wilds. Now, if you can move up a little bit, someone else could read a little bit because this is so beautiful. A combatant in silent, dreadful lists, the world unknowing, for the world she stood. No helper. Had she saved the strength within, there was no witness of terrestrial eyes. The gods above and nature's soul below were the spectators of that mighty strife. So again, she is totally alone. She's a combatant. Obviously, mother is a combatant. In silent, dreadful lists. So these lists are very powerful, but they're silent, and yet they're dreadful. And the world doesn't know anything. How many, how many people in the world knew Mother and Sri Aurobindo? And how many fewer read them? And how many fewer became their disciples or devotees. So she has no helper except the strength within, and strength is capitalized here, very important. And of course there was no witness of terrestrial eyes because none of us could see what was happening. Only the gods above and nature, soul below. Both gods and nature are capitalized here. The gods above and nature, soul below, were the spectators of that mighty strife. Well, now we see that she is in Satyavan's homeland. Around her were the austere sky-pointing hills. And the green, murmurous, broad, deep-thoughted woods muttered incessantly their muffled spell. A dense, magnificent, colored, self-wrapped life, draped in the leaves, vivid, emerald monotone, and set with checkered sunbeams and blithe flowers, immured her destiny's secluded scene. It's very interesting. She's, she's in the woods. And as we see, such a one homeland is almost surrounded by woods. There's only a, a few pastures or fields that are open. And they are very beautiful. But the, the woods are mur murmuring incessantly their muffled spell. And if you've been in deep woods before, 
you probably have experienced this because there is always a sound going on. It could be the sound of the wind. It could be the sound of the animals or the birds. And yes, most of the time in the woods, the spell is muffled. And he calls it a spell here. Very, very important. Muttered incessantly their muffled spell. So there is a magic when we enter the forests that is unlike any other feeling in the world. Well, same thing when we enter the sea. If you, if you scuba dive, you experience that another world completely different from this world. So here, the green, well, the austere sky pointing hills, the hills are always pointing towards the sky, growing towards the sky. The green, murmurous, broad, deep thoughted woods. So the murmurous, we hear that murmur, we hear that murmur. You can feel it in the earth at times very clearly. Muttered incessantly without stopping their mother muffled spell. And then he says, a dense, magnificent, colored, self-wrapped life. Look at the words, dense, magnificent, colored, self-wrapped life. Extraordinary life. Uh, this life is not open to all. You would have to live in nature and be with nature for a long time to understand this, this self-wrapped life. It, it's a contained life. It's complete in itself. I've been in forests where young hemlock trees were growing out of the stumps, the rotted stumps of trees, and the whole place was, was magical. And so this self-wrapped life is draped, beautiful line, draped in the vivid emerald monotone of the leaves. Because green has many, many colors, undoubtedly, but it's a monotone. It's one tone of green, one tone that is green. But draped in these leaves, vivid emerald monotone, and set with checkered sunbeams, well, we know what checkered is, blithe flowers, immured her destiny's secluded scene. Now, I would like to go to the lexicon of an infinite mind and give you a few definitions, because I think it's important that we, that we understand definitions in Savitri too, because Sri Aurobindo would not use any word just for embellishment. Every word. I, I saw a video last night with Patrick Stewart and his first meeting with, uh, I believe, it, was it, no, it wasn't Olivier, it was uh, Ian McKellen. And, the, and he was studying the role of Macbeth and the passage with tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And McKellen tells him, and is the most important word in that passage. Very interesting. So we have to even pay attention to the word and very carefully. Okay, so check it. Check it first. Checkered uh, is marked by numerous and various shifts and changes. It could also be diversified in color and variegated. So these sunbeams, 
for me, they're changes, huh? checkered sunbeams. Sometimes you see a little of the sunbeam, sometimes in another area where it's open, it's coming down fully. Sometimes it's coming through the leaves. How beautiful. Checkered sunbeams. Now, blithe flowers. Blythe uh, is right here. Joyous, merry, or gay in disposition. Glad, cheerful. These cheerful flowers. And then lastly, I think, immured, because that's an important word. If anyone knows these very clearly, you can just save me looking up for you and give me the definition. Immured, shut in, secluded, or confined. So her destiny's secluded scene is shut in, obviously. She's, she's living only with Satchivan and his mother and father, uh, but she's still totally alone because she can't share anything. And she's doing the regular work of the house every day, except the one day when she has to go with Satchivan, and that will come much later on. So in this place, with these checkered sunbeams, these blithe flowers that have immured her destiny, secluded scene. What happens? Um, when, uh, when also dramatically, it's quite interesting to see, for example, such a line, as you said, uh, the, a dense, magnificent, colored, self-wrapped life, um, which is... Um, there was somewhere I was reading of the, in the future poetry, the objection to Sri Aurobindo not using um, in between different um, uh, adjectives, not using and, you know, uh, dense and magnificent. Yes, yes. That, that's a good point. And also, you see, A.E. wrote to him, A.E., the famous George Russell, mm -hmm. whose poetry many of us have loved for so many years wrote to him and says, why are you using so many of these adjectives? Uh, it's just too much. Mm -hmm. It's too much. And Sri Arbindo replies to him, I have only written what I have seen or experienced. Mm -hmm. Wow. Nothing more. Only what he had seen or experienced. Mm -hmm. Ashwini, could you read a little for us? There has she grown to the stature of her spirit, the genius of titanic silences, steeping her soul in its wide loneliness. Had she had shown to her herself's bare reality and mated her with her environment. Ah, so... We, uh, we have a couple of interesting things here. Whenever I uh, copy these lines, uh, the, gr the grammarians always want to tell me that you cannot have two hers next to each other. All right, right. <laughs> she are going to break all the rules. The, the, the famous comment, I think it was of Narod Baran, it could have been of Amal, where they said, uh, Sri Aurobindo did not write in English. Sri, Sri Aurobindo wrote English. A major difference. But there is a pause in between, so it is possible. It's like um, like one pada, one uh, one stanza oh, yeah. is finished. No, absolutely correct. Mm. Absolutely mm. correct. Even is he uses twice mm. next to each other. Uh, all that is is he right <laughs> and he is the more than all that is oh. so the genius of titanic silences this word genius is so important here because Sri Aurobindo uses it very uniquely uh, he 
he speaks of the genius, and Mother does also, of the species. So we have the genius of the species in man, in nature, in almost everything there is a genius of the species. And here it's the genius of titanic silences, vast silences that steeps her soul in its wide loneliness. And that genius had shown to her herself's bare reality and mated her with her environment. What happened next? Uh, Edith? Its solitude greatened her human hours with a background of the eternal and unique. A little more. A force of spare direct necessity reduced the heavy framework of man's days and his overburdening mass of outward needs to a first thin strip of simple animal wants and the mighty wildness of the primitive earth and the brooding multitude of patient trees and the musing sapphire leisure of the sky and the solemn weight of the slowly passing month had left in her deep room for thought and God. Well, as we've learned many times before in, already in Savitri, that uh, this is a very, very almost ascetic life she's leading because uh, the solitude of that environment that showed to her her self-spare reality and, and greatened her human hours by its solitude with, with the background, of course, of the eternal and the unique. Now he, he begins to tell us about what she is doing here, a force of spare, direct necessity, reduce the heavy framework of man's days. Well, and his overburdening mass of outward needs. Well, we know all about that, don't we, in life. And what did it do? Well, it reduced it first to a thin strip of simple animal wants. Okay. So, if we could get rid of all of our overburdening mass of outward needs, if we could just live so simply, now animal wants is, is not in a negative here or pejorative sense, but it's, but it's what we need to survive, the food we need, the sleep we need, uh, the exercise we need, the... Uh, The very few things that we need, they were stripped away from her because she's living in this primitive place, very primitive. And she's among these, this multitude of brooding, patient trees. Here again, if one knows nature a bit, we feel the brooding of many trees. And Mother speaks about it in uh, the book that we've done on the flowers, the first book. And she speaks of how the, when the sun goes down, is, is almost a, a cry from the trees for the light that they need. And they're feeling brooding multitude of patient trees. They're very patient, of course. The tree is very slow in its growth. In fact, in this whole evolutionary process of, of nature, we find that when a forest is destroyed by fire 
and all the hardwoods are killed, immediately there come what we call nurse trees. And we have some of those nurse trees in Oroville that I first introduced, and they're called work trees. Many people have not liked them because they're very, they, they proliferate, but, but they are wonderful trees because they give the shade that's necessary for the hardwoods to grow. So we have the brooding multitude of patient trees. We have the musing sapphire leisure of the sky. And then we have the solemn weight of the slowly passing months. Well, right now they're passing slowly for her because she still has many days to go, but in, uh, until we get to, to the book where he dies and, and, and she's aware that he's going to die. And then, and then the months and the days come much faster. But, but these slowly passing months had left in her deep room for thought and God. I think that's a wonderful place where we could end today. And thank you all for joining. If there are any questions about what we've read, you can write to me or we can do them online as we are now. Um, if there are questions about definitions or structure of the lines, um, I'm sure that uh, that Vladimir and I will be able to help you. And if we're not, we'll find the answer in Mother and Sri Aurobindo. <laughs>